Hi everyone, welcome to episode 21. My guest today is four stripe BJJ brown belt from Bruckman Martial Arts in Ontario, Canada, Kyle Sleeman. It's time to high five and fist bump. A jiu jitsu podcast for the everyday grappler. Let's talk subs, let's talk positions, let's talk dominating the mats. Welcome to the Let's Talk Jiu Jitsu podcast with Raymond Terrence. Okay, so my guest today is a four stripe BJJ brown belt training out of Bruckman Martial Arts in Ontario, Canada. Kyle Sleeman, Let's Talk Jiu Jitsu. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, thanks for jumping in. Like I was telling you before, you know, sometimes it takes a, a couple of weeks to get uh, things set up and going. I sent you a message or you sent me a message and we spoke like two days ago and you're already on the show. So that's great. Thanks for being on. Yeah, man. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm on top of things. So you tell me you want me on, uh, I'll uh, make time for it. So awesome. appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much. So maybe tell everybody how you got into martial arts. Uh, you sent me a little bio, but tell everybody how you first started off in martial arts and uh, why uh, why you got started and how you got started. All right. Well, uh, when I when I was um, young, like uh, like two years old, I took a a major interest in martial arts and hand-to-hand combat. My father actually was um, a martial artist and he was in Taekwondo. So they got me in that very young. And uh, I did that for, I want to say about 13 years before I found uh, judo. And I had a little bit of an idea about judo due to watching the UFC one. Right. So I thought, you know what, this is pretty cool. This is a, this is along that sort of idea. So I did that for a number of years. And then one day um, I was walking to this ice cream shop after judo class and I seen this sign on the wall saying Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I thought, oh man, I got to go check this out. So I went downstairs. It turned out it was Justin Bruckman, Antonio Carvalho, Richard Nanku, all these guys training super hard, right? So uh, I I was hooked from then. Did did you go down to the Jiu Jitsu before or after you got ice cream? Um, actually, I think it was after. Okay. <laughs> okay, nice. That's good. And w- w- when, when, when you were doing judo, did you get a chance to do any jiu-jitsu while you were doing judo? You know what? There's, there's so much that, that translates over, right? Like it's, um, it's very, it's very mixed, but I didn't know what jiu-jitsu was at that time, really, other than just watching it. So we, you know, we did maybe 10, 15% was our groundwork and it was very basic groundwork. It was mainly throws, um, around that time. It was when they were taking out the, um, attacking the legs. So it was like a weird time in judo. Um, I don't think there was much jujitsu involved to be honest. And that, that seems to happen quite often. I did quite a bit of judo work a few years of judo. I have a blue belt in judo. And uh, I remember that we were a school actually that was super focused on the ground game on jujitsu. And I only discovered afterwards that most judo schools don't spend that much time on the ground. So maybe I was just blessed with an instructor that, you know, enjoyed that, that part of the game or the, the, like, or, or the part of judo. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time on the ground, but like, like you were saying, I think most schools, most judo schools spend most of their time standing up and very little on the ground. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of it's not about pure self-defense. A lot of it's about sport, right? Because of the Olympics. So they're all dedicated towards sport. Hmm. And did you do you find yourself, did you t- did you take some things from judo into your jiu-jitsu? So now when you compete, do you find yourself not minding standing up and going for takedowns and things like that? Well, uh, I, I find like uh, my confidence in jiu-jitsu standing up is is based from my from my judo. Um, not so much being on the offense, but being confident that I can't get taken down. Hmm. You know, of course I get taken down, but I, I feel like 90, 95% of the time I get the two points um, based from from that beginnings, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I a- find it helps me a lot. But the thing is, when I, when I compete, I strategize, right? So I don't want to always give away my judo right off the bat. I want to maybe you know, play the game of jujitsu. And then halfway through the match, when I know you're huffing and puffing, I'll drag that fight back to the feet. Now I'll throw you. 
Oh, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. I, I, I think most guys in jiu-jitsu who obviously don't have a judo background are always nervous when it comes to standing up. And especially when it comes to those, maybe that last minute or the last 30 seconds when, you know, you're, you're basically down on points. And the only thing that can save you is a takedown. And if you don't have that confidence to do it, you know, which most people don't, you know, they're basically stuck in a game of, a losing game basically because they don't know how to do a takedown but it's, it's really interesting that strategy that you have where where you know and you're confident that you can go for those points at the end of a match if you really need them right yeah exactly and to throw somebody it's hard to throw somebody when they're ready to be thrown mm-hmm. right but if you if you don't give away that you have good throws later in the match when you're both tired or he's exhausted or whatever He's not expecting you to pull out some good hip throws and or 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 trips and things like that because you you would have shown your A game off the start. Hmm. But I never show my A game off the start. I always show my A game when I really need it. Hmm. That that's a really interesting strategy. I've never heard anyone say that before. But yeah, that it definitely makes sense. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Tell me a little bit about your academy and where you're training. Well, uh, I train under Justin Bruckman. Um, he's one of the pioneers in Canada when, uh, Silvio Baring came up here, you know, probably in the mid nineties, I guess. And, uh, so Justin was one of the first black belts around Canada. So I'm under Justin, which I'm very privileged. Um, Antonio Carvalho's there, um, David Domini and all these guys are world, uh, like world-class in my opinion. So, um, we have a lot of good guys there. We have probably 200 students there at that club. So uh, Justin's doing very well. He, yeah. So. And how long have you been uh, with Justin for? How many years? I started uh, with Justin in 2006. So I guess it's been about 13 and a half years. It's been uh, I've been pretty consistent over that time as well. So. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. And what kind of instructor uh, is Justin? If you had to describe him. Well, Justin has a judo background. He okay, actually come from judo. Uh, he's the rough and tough, grind, grind, grind sort of attitude, and uh, basically he he breaks his opponents, and uh, I can vouch for that one. <laughs> nice. Okay, that's good. So you you you've been with him for thirteen years, and I was actually talking in another podcast about. Um, people switching academies and moving from one academy to another. So you, you've built yourself some pretty strong roots being there for so many years. So why do you think that you've been there for so long? Have you ever contemplating switching clubs or has it ever crossed your mind or have you always been set on always training there? What, what's, what's basically keeping you there in that specific academy? Well, um, I think the difference between our academy and other academies is how tight knit we are. We're, we're basically a big family. We're uh, like, like Justin says, we're the Island of misfit toys. We've all met up for a reason and uh, nobody wants to stray away from what's working. Right. And what's working is working. Nice. So, uh, but not my, I think my number one quality in myself is my loyalty to begin with. So, uh, I would never, I would never stray away from somebody who's helped me so much. That's mm. just not possible. Mm. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Which is something that I mentioned too was that you know instructors do more than just open the doors, teach a class, and then shut the lights and close the doors again, right? They're they're investing so much of their time and their energy in you, and a lot most a lot of the time it's not just on the mats, but they're doing the same thing off of mats. So you know that there are some people that say, you know what, I, I, I pay for a membership so I can do what I want. But I guess people that are really like doing the grind and are somewhere for, you know, for many years, they understand that it's much more than that, right? That you can't just jump ship. And there is some loyalty in an academy. You know, if you've been there for a long time, you understand that people are there to help you out and, you know, they're there to develop you and you're there to help them too. So that's, that, that, that's really interesting. Do you guys have a big uh, competition team uh, where you guys are? Are there a lot of competitors? You know, we don't have a lot of competitors actually. Um, I think the majority of our club is uh, very recreational. It's pretty laid back. Um, we have a few competitors, but I wouldn't say we have a, like a competition team or anything like that. Hmm. But uh, going back to what you just said about paying a membership and people having like um, sort of this entitlement because they pay a membership, right? Yeah. In my opinion, I, I, I pay Justin a membership to help keep the lights on, to help pay rent. 
Like it, it's a, that's a part of my family duty. I pitch in as a, as a family member. I think that's only, you know, called for. Right. No, no, that, that, that's, that, that's definitely a good point. I mean, you know, they're there for, for, for everybody else. So we're trying to do what we can to kind of help them out at the same time. Right. And there, there are a lot of Jiu-Jitsu instructors that don't do that full time. They have other jobs, they do other things. So whatever we can do to help out, obviously we're going to try to do so. It's funny that you say that you guys, you know, if you're around 200 members um, and that you have a small competitive team, uh, that's interesting because I think a lot of Jiu-Jitsu schools are like that, that have a lot of members, you know, that are around that 200 mark or 300 mark at Brazilian top team here where I train it. We're, we're kind of in the same boat. There's a lot of stu- a lot of students. It's a lot of people just wanting to train and want to do an activity. And you know, there's a small group of core competitors. But I would say most people are just an everyday grappler that go to class and want to learn jujitsu and want to have fun and build relationships. Um, I've only been to. You know, I, I see other schools where they have really strong competitive teams and very few uh, recreational jiu-jitsu practitioners. And I think people get that vibe when you go to a school and you try something out, you'll know right away what you're getting right as a product. Um, I don't think there are very many schools out there who are selling themselves strictly as competitive schools. I think most jiu-jitsu schools are trying to appeal to the masses saying that anyone can do jiu-jitsu. Um, you yourself, you're a, you're an active competitor. So I have you on Facebook. I see that you're competing all the time and you, you just competed at the Toronto open. So how, how did that go for you? Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, I ended up uh, taking silver. Um, nobody was in my weight class. So I went, uh, went up to middleweight so I didn't have to, uh, eat light all weeks, which was nice. <laughs> nice. So, uh, yeah, so my, my first match in the quarterfinals, um, it was pretty close, uh, it was 6-4. I ended up winning 6-4. I got a couple takedowns there in a sweep. So I got that one, and then I went on to the semifinals. Um, I f- competed against a guy from Montreal, I believe, Fabio Holanda's club, I think. That's my club. <laughs> Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, his name was um, Francois. Oh, um, Francis. Could it be Francis? Maybe. Okay. I, I think it's it, – what was uh, it uh, – it might have been Francis Gumby. Does that does that sound familiar? Bony, Bony B-O-N-N-Y, I think. Mm, I have no idea. So, any, anyway, okay. so, um, yeah, that was uh, – I did well on that one. I beat him 15 nothing. Okay. And then I went into the uh, finals there, and I was uh, – I was up five nothing. I was putting the pressure to him. I felt uh, I had it in the bag, and a quick situation happened. It turned into a scramble. My toe left the connection of the mat just briefly, and he was able to catch an ankle lock on me. No way. So, yeah, his name was Joe Thomas. So shout out to Joe Thomas. Uh, props to you, bro. Well, and how much time was left in the round? Uh, I I want to say probably two minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity I got to compete. Right. So I can't, I can't hang my head. Right. Nice. So nice. And, and you, do you find yourself competing quite often? Do you travel a lot to, to be able to compete? I, um, I try and compete as much as I can. Like I work shift work as it is right now. So I work like two weekends a month basically. So if a competition lands on a weekend that I'm free and I'm not injured, well, I'll just go compete instead of, going to open mats nice. right so that's all i see competitions mainly now it's just a it's just another role nice. right so it's nothing stressful if i have the time off i'll go compete but um traveling to compete i haven't done much of that i just mainly been traveling to do these uh jujitsu camps and that's uh that's the extent of my traveling for jujitsu really i'd like to uh travel to compete a lot more for sure but you guys tend to have a lot of competitions in Ontario. Unfortunately, in Quebec, obviously, we can't compete. So most of us, if we want to compete, we head over to Ontario to be able to compete. Uh, you guys have a lot of things going on. You have the Ontario Open, which is a really good uh, tournament, too. Um, but I would say every couple weekends, you guys have something going on in Ontario. But I guess if you're working shift work, it has to fall on that weekend that you're not working, right? Well, exactly. That's the thing, right? There's only like... You know, if uh, if there's one a month and it doesn't land on my uh, my day off, then I can't do that one. So yeah. And how do you find the um, the level in Ontario when it comes to brown belts when you're uh, when you're competing? 
Uh, it's all over the place. Um, I, it's hard to say, like I haven't competed in other countries. Um, so I, it's hard to say, but the difference, like when I roll with other brown belts or whatever like that in, uh, like the globe charters camps that I go to in the States and stuff, I would say they're all roughly the same. I don't, I wouldn't say Canada is any far below. That's for sure. Nice. Yeah. I, I think, I think we have a good level of jujitsu here in Canada, especially in, in Quebec and Ontario, which is, I guess the two places I spend most of my time and I see most jujitsu schools and get to talk to people. Um, I think all over Canada, I think we're doing really well. I think the issue now is the Canadian dollar just isn't very strong compared to the American dollar. So, you know, going and competing in the States is, is a huge ordeal, right? You're spending whatever, over $1,000 or $2,000 to go compete a weekend in the States because, you know, the exchange rate, you have to pay for a hotel and whatnot. So it, it, it gets very complicated and it gets very expensive. So I think it's discouraging people to go compete in the States. Do you, do you think that there's any ways or anything that we can do to kind of get maybe more tournaments here in Canada, whether it be, you know, in Ontario or, or provinces close by? Um because right now, I mean, there are a lot in, in, in Ontario. I think it's the one place because us Mont Montrealers can't compete or people in Quebec, so we tend to go over there to compete. But do you find yourself, you know, collaborating with other schools? Does Bruckman do that? Or are, is, is it a very sociable school when it comes to talking to other academies and see what, seeing what's going on on the competition circuit? Um, so, like, like you're meaning kind of like... Uh... You know, this, when it, this, uh, yeah, cause, yeah, cause, yeah. Well, cause there, there are a lot of academies out there that are kind of in their little bubble. Basically, is, is, yeah. is you know, everyone kind of does their own thing. Right. And I would say we, we used to have that quite a bit here in Montreal, would, where each academy would kind of stick to their own people and they wouldn't communicate very much or wasn't much talking. And because there's a lack of competition and tournaments here, it's I guess it's it's kind of stopped people from talking and communicating but since you guys see each other often in competitions is there a good communication between your academy and other academies do people tend to socialize quite a bit yeah actually i uh i train at maybe like you know five different academies right we we bounce all over the place um everybody's in touch with each other everybody all competitors that are competing we all like bump into each other train like I'll go to action reaction, like Ringo's club and there's tons of competitors there. And, you know, so I have everybody, all these competitors, we all like talk, we all keep in touch and things like that. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's changed, right? So that's, that's for the better, but Back in the day, if you were to say maybe seven or eight years ago, that was not the case at all, right? Academies would go compete. They All the competitors from the same school would huddle together. There would be like no talking, no chatting. You're basically there to do one thing and compete and then go home. But it's changed a lot over the years now, right? Especially with social media and Facebook and Instagram. People are, are a lot more connected. And I guess there's more of a social aspect between academies now, which, which is really nice because I bet when you first started in Jiu Jitsu, that wasn't the case at all. Right. Yeah, that was yeah complete opposite. And there's been a big boom in the, um, in the tournaments ever since, uh, remember when they made it legal in Ontario, illegal in Ontario, like they did in Quebec. Right? right. Since, since then there's been a huge boom and there's like one every month, sometimes two a month now. But the thing is, there's so many good guys in Ontario and they, and we need the IBJJF to come here, you know, and do more tournaments around in Canada. They'll come to Toronto and that's about it. Like yeah. the top competitors got to go spend money and go compete in the States and things like that. Like they really shouldn't have to, they should be able to bring the tournaments here and make the same amount of money. Yeah, no. Right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we have so much good talent here in Canada and it's so hard to showcase that good talent if tournaments won't come here. Right. Well, exactly. And that's the thing. So like hmm. they can't like you can't guys, guys that are like 23 years old. They want to be able to compete and rack up all these points in IBJJF and they have to go travel now. And like, how are they supposed to do that? So yeah. they kind of they kind of ruin the opportunity for Canadians in a sense when they're saying that the IBJJF that's the only good event that people can win right yeah. but they only bring one tournament here yeah 23 year old travel to the states all the time 
I, I, I don't know so, about you, but when I was 23 years old, I had zero cash. So I don't know if it's different zero. now. <laughs> zero. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about uh, about the classes at your academy. So maybe uh, run me through a, a typical class. So do you guys do a warm up? Do you jump into technique? So how long are your classes and what does a class look like? You know what? At our class, every instructor kind of runs their class differently. Hmm. Um, sometimes we'll do a warm up, um, you know, solo person drills. And then maybe some techniques, some rolling, things like that. Sometimes we'll just warm up drilling for half the class, then rolling. Um, it all depends on who's teaching it, what they feel, what they've been, what they taught previous class. So it's it's hard to say because everybody has their own ways, right? Like there's guys that teach the advanced class and then there's guys that teach the basics or, or sorry, novice class, we call it. And uh, yeah, so there's there's different structures per instructor and and are, are your classes an hour or an hour and a half so our novice class is an hour and our advanced class is an hour and a half okay nice and you guys do do you do roll every class yeah we do we roll every class in the novice class they do a little bit of rolling okay. um but in the advanced class we yeah we roll a lot like fridays we'll do an hour and a half of rolling six minute rounds with 30 seconds rest for the whole hour and a half. Wow. Right. So, and to be honest, my, my personal training, I probably drill 3% of my jujitsu. I roll 97% <laughs> of my jujitsu is rolling. That's hilarious. That was actually going to be one of my questions to you. Do you guys do a lot of drilling? The reason why I bring this up with literally everyone I have on the podcast is because we're in a school that, that, we, we basically do next to no drilling. I mean, every now and then we'll land on a class and there's an instructor that wants to destroy everyone. So, you know, we tend to do, you know, lots of drilling in one class. And after that, you'll go, you know, X amount of classes without doing any. But uh, I, I've been saying this a lot, that there are more and more academies that are doing less drilling and more live rolling, right? Do you find that you get more out of the live rolling than if you were drilling? So I my like, there is... Um... So my club, like Bruckman Martial Arts, they probably drill 50% of the time okay. and then roll 50% of the time. But my training, I don't really drill. I just do like, I just roll. You just do jujitsu. <laughs> I just do jiu-jitsu. So at one time, you know, you learn all the moves, you learn all the chess pieces, right? Mm -hmm. at, at this point of my jujitsu, I honestly, I don't even, I don't even use techniques that I've ever learned. I just use concepts. So like gi, no gi, wearing a snowsuit, a, a wedding dress, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. Concepts of jujitsu are the exact same, right? Did, so did you find you could only do that at, at your level? And I'm saying as a experienced brown belt, do you find that you're capable of doing that only now? Have you, were you able to do that example as a purple belt? I uh, I start I started playing with that at purple I guess. Yeah, you, well, the thing is you have to know all the pieces, how the pieces move, and all the movements and everything like that. And once you once you know all the rules, then you can actually break rules. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Okay. So like for example, um, I'm kind of going off track now. Oh, this is perfect. I love ramble. it. <laughs> so for example, rule number one of jujitsu when you're in somebody's guard is never put your hand in or they'll triangle you. Right. Right. But when you know that rule, you can break it. So when I put my hand in and you jump for the triangle, I just block it and pass. Hmm. So how can you triangle me when I know that the triangle is coming? So you're basically you know baiting him into the triangle because you have something set up to stop the triangle. Yeah, by breaking the rules that you should never break. Okay, right? okay. <laughs> the same thing. If you're sitting in your guard, you never, you never put your arm sitting right in his, in the guy's lap. Right. Because you're gonna armbar me, right? Mm -hmm. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you my arm, and the second your foot goes on my hip to angle off for the armbar, I pull that out and pass, hmm. or back out of the guard, and then now I'm in an open guard. I'm not stuck in your clothes. So, right? so, so I didn't yeah. actually open your guard using a guard break. You opened your guard for you. 
or for me without me using any effort. Hmm. Psycho- psych- psychologically, I made you open your guard up. Hmm. So, white, so I don't use white... techniques, I use concepts. Right. So white belts should definitely not follow this advice in any possible way. <laughs> yes. Correct. Correct. <laughs> No, I, I find that really interesting. No, that, that definitely makes sense, right? So you're you're basically giving them something and they're like, oh, wow, he's giving me the opportunity. Now's the time. But in reality, you're already two steps ahead, right? Because you already know what's going on. Okay. Okay, so if you were in my guard right now, mm-hmm. I'm on my back and you're in my guard. Yeah. And you gave me your right arm. You just put it on my lap. Yeah. And you thought... There's no way this guy can armbar me because I'm ready for the armbar, right? Right. The second I went for the armbar, dude, I'm not catching you with it. You're out of there, right? Right. Exactly. Hmm. Okay. That, that, that's. The second that... I open my legs to armbar you, it, it, what do you want in, when you're sitting in somebody's guard? You want out of the guard. You want a guard break to get out to pass. Right. Yeah. So when the guy opens his feet to armbar, boom, done. And do you find that, that that helps you a lot when you're competing at a brown belt level? Do you, you find that brown belts take that bait? Um, in competition, uh, yeah, they take the bait because you're on a time limit. Okay. So everything's a bit quicker. It's, a, it's more of a race. And that's where you can, and myself, can fall into traps because you're racing too quickly. Hmm. Um. But if you slow down a bit, you can get called for stalling. So it's a it's a it's a fine line, right? Right. Do you all do you have a game plan when you go when you go to compete? Do you do you set yourself in stone with, you know what? These are my two sweeps that I do all the time. These are my two submissions from this position. Do you have like a core that you use all, all the time, or do you go into competition and say what well, whatever happens happens? Um. No, I don't. I don't really have a. I have an idea. And my idea is to shut your game down. Mm-hmm. That's it. I don't actually have a game plan. So, for example, if me and you were going to square off right now, depending on how you're standing, I can figure out which hand you're going to reach and grab my lapel with, right? Right. So the second you reach out, because for the last six weeks, you've been reaching out to get your initial grip that you want. And that first reach out is going for that initial grip. Mm-hmm. And if I um, if I grab that grip, as you reach out to grab my lapel, if I control that wrist before it can actually grip my lapel, and you can't get that grip, you're now on plan B, which you haven't trained for. Hmm. You've only trained for four weeks based off your good throw or your good takedown or your good guard pull. But a second I grab your wrist, you're on plan B, right? Right. So that's all I'm doing is I'm just literally shutting down your your plans in and a sense. And you're forcing so people to go do a plan B. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. So the second I grab your wrist, now I can arm drag or something, and you have to defend it right away. But yet you were started with the initial attack, hmm. right? So – yeah, basically, I'm just controlling. I'm just making sure you can't grip me. So my hands, when I'm starting off like in a match, like in judo or or jujitsu, my hands, you know how people hold them in front of their their chest, like 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 a, like a prayer, right? Yeah, like a prayer to reach out and grab the person. Mm-hmm. My hands are there not to grab you. My hands are there to protect my lapels and to to catch your hand coming in to grab my lapel. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, because that, 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 to, that's, what's... that's definitely an experienced brown belt talking because that's when I get from, you know, that it took me a while to figure that out to to not accept grips because my yeah. professor, Fred, who whenever I would allow him to get a grip on me, it, it was always bad news afterwards. And it took me a while to figure it out, but I realized that the second that he had his hand on me, I had to do everything in my power to get rid of that grip. That was my number one priority because without removing that grip, I can't set up my own game. And if I'm removing that grip from him, that means I'm stopping him from doing what he wants to do, right? And if he's already there and he has his hand in and I can't get it off, I mean, I'm fighting someone who's a black belt. He obviously knows what he's doing. So I can definitely relate to what you're saying. 
Yeah, so think about this. If you were reaching out right now with your right hand, and I blocked that and pressed it down and grabbed your lapel with my right hand, I can attack right away. Mm -hmm. Because your hand that I grabbed isn't on my lapel, so you can't stiff arm me away from you. Right. I can come in for like an Asoto Gary or anything like that. So when you start a match, you, did you spend a lot of time? So I know you were saying that you obviously don't want to divulge your tools right at the beginning of a match. So you like you'll you'll save some judo at the end when someone's tired to try to get those points if need be. Do do you find yourself pulling guard or do you wait for him to sit down or how does a match usually start off for you? Do do you just feel the guy out and wait for something to happen or? Um, I kind of just feel it out. If if he wants to pull guard then he's just putting himself in a further defensive scenario in my opinion you know how you know how half guard is actually half pass right right and then quarter guard is further down the down the offensive slash defensive chain mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so if you pull guard the only thing you're doing is you're pulling a defensive scenario even though you may have an offensive attack, I consider half guard on bottom, that's called half pass. <laughs> that's it. Right? Half guard is when you're on top. Half pass is when you're on bottom. Right, and especially if, if you're in a competition scenario and you're in top half guard and it ends up staying there for whatever reason for five minutes or six minutes, you're the one that's going to win at the end, right? Because you're the one who's trying to pass the guy's guard. The guy's not doesn't have any advantages from being on the bottom and bottom half. So, so I see what you're getting at. Like there's, don't get me wrong. There's guys that are like, that'll pull guard and submit me like no tomorrow. Like, don't get me <laughs> wrong. But the reality is you can't score as easily from the bottom as you can on top. So if you're thinking of winning a jujitsu match strategically, you always, like, I think like poker, like what, what puts the, odds in my favor in any situation because that's how i have to play my hand mm -hmm. right so if i'm gonna start and, and pull guard i'm pulling i'm, I'm already i'm throwing 25 percent of my strategy at the window and i said not strategy but like my whole defensive scenario okay you know it's kind of like striking with one hand behind your back off the start in my opinion I see. So, so I, I, I take from what you're saying that you enjoy being on top. <laughs> um, yeah, I like, I like being on top in a, in a, in a, in a competition setting where I have to score points. Yes. When I'm playing around at the club, I, I, I'm a guard player. I play around on my back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you were saying that, that you're, you, you, you're usually a middleweight no, I'm actually a lightweight. Okay. Um, I so lightweight. I have to be 168 with a gi on, mm -hmm. and I, I'm about 172 with a gi on. So I usually have to cut about three or four pounds, maybe five pounds for lightweight. But then if I do middleweight, I can just walk in and be the like one of the lowest guys of the division, which always makes me feel like I'm the quickest. Right. right? Anytime lowest guy in the division i i have confidence that, oh i'm the fastest guy so i turn every situation around into my favor right nice and i guess you don't stress out between i guess if you just end up in that division do you do you really try to put a focus on being lightweight or are you do you just end up you know near competition and say well this is where i'm going to end up and it's a little bit more casual just because there's a lot of competitors that i know and i used to be in that boat that i was cutting you know, six, seven, eight pounds to be able to get, in my case, I was trying to get the middle. And the last thing I wanted to do is be in medium, medium heavy because these guys were 200 pounds cutting the 195. But I was having such a hard time in a weight cut that eventually I said, you know what, I'm just going to do medium heavy. I don't have to have any stress going in and, you know, worry about not having the energy levels and being dehydrated and this and that. But then when I was doing that, I noticed that, you know, the guys were so massive, you know, I'd go in at 187 or 188. But these guys were just so much bigger than me, sometimes so much taller than me that I was really having a hard time. So it took me cleaning up my diet 
to naturally be around the 181 mark so I didn't have to cut all that weight so now I could you know compete in middle and you know I don't have to do any major weight cuts how do you kind of approach the whole you know do I go into middle or do I go to lightweight does it stress you out is it something you really focus to go to lightweight or so that's a that's a good question because that can go so many different ways the the weight doesn't really bother me because I trust in my jujitsu. Hmm. My jujitsu works against all weights, and I know that. Um, so it doesn't matter to me. I but, love that. Like my <laughs> my ultimate goal is to make the podium an absolute every time. Hmm. So if I try and cut four pounds of lightweight, and then I want to make absolute podium, right? What what would be the point? Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, when I, when I want to cut to lightweight, I'm doing it because I have some motivation, right? Um, when I cut to lightweight, I feel like I'm going to be the biggest guy in the division. When I cut, when I stay at my normal weight and I go to middleweight, and like you said, guys are cutting from, you know, whatever, like 190 to make middleweight. I see that as they're only going to be depleted. They're only going to be at 75%. I'm going to have a steak dinner, chicken parm dinner, cheesecake. And I'm going to go in there full of energy and they're not going to be ready for it because they're going to be eating peanuts and, or bird seed. And I'm get, I'm coming in heat blazing. Hmm. I like what you said so, that I trust in my jujitsu and not my weight, right? That your, that your weight isn't defining what you're going to do. It's your jujitsu that's defining no matter what weight class you're in. That's right, because if size mattered, the elephant be king of the jungle. Hmm. Who's the king of the jungle? The lion is. Right. Lion doesn't care what his weight is; he just attacks. Hmm. That's really interesting. That's 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 definitely going to make me think about what I'm doing <laughs> when it comes to weight classes. Because now I'm going to yeah. feel like a punk if I decide to start cutting weight to go to 181. I'd be like, no, Kyle told me I should just trust in my jujitsu. <laughs> Exactly. Bro. And the thing is, a lot of people cut weight because they're worried about the opponent. You think your opponent's going to be better than you, so you need to go down a weight class. You don't, man. You just need to worry about you. What's going to make you perform the best? And that's a good meal in your system the night before. Yeah. It's all about how you're going to approach it. You need to bring your A game. Don't worry about him. Hmm. He's going down. So, so, so speaking of, I, I know you had mentioned uh, Globe Trotters Camp, and you were telling me in your bio that that you that you're trying to teach at a lot of camps. It's really funny that you mentioned Globe Trotters because I did my first Globe Trotters three years ago. I did the Globe Trotters in um, in Maine. Was it Maine? Yeah, Maine. I, right. I, yeah. I, I, I were, did you go to that one in Maine? Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to correct you there. I've, I'm not an. I don't teach at the camps. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I just attend them. Okay, nice. Um, a, a goal of mine is to teach one day at the Globe Charters camps. This uh this coming, this coming April 2020 in Mexico. Actually, I haven't told anybody, but uh, I'm actually an instructor at that Mexico camp. It's called BJJ in Paradise. Okay, cool. So that's gonna be cool. So, but going back to your your. Your globe charters thing there, yeah, the main camp, that's awesome, eh? Yeah, it was really cool. I was um a blue belt. I was like at the end of my blue belt at the time, and I had a buddy who had been to a globe charters camp, and he was raving about it. And I went online, and I was like, oh man, it's like a thousand bucks American. I was like, this is gonna be a fortune, but like it was like my time to do it. It was either then or like it just was never gonna happen. So I I went. Um, I find I, at the time there wasn't many higher belts that were there, which was, um, you know, there, there weren't very many purple belts. It was mostly white and blue belts that were there. I was really hoping for a lot more, you know, purples and browns. And it just, it, it could have just been that specific camp on that date. I just, you know, it just happened to be like that. But the experience was amazing, you know, sleeping in, in these cabins with a bunch of different jujitsu guys and girls. And, you know, everyone got to socialize for a week and, you know, every hour on the hour there was a different guy teaching jiu-jitsu and it was just like it was so much jiu-jitsu and even though i wanted to do every single class it just it was not possible <laughs> like physically possible i had to take a break at some point but it was really really uh, uh, 
a amazing experience and I would definitely love to go back to one. Maybe not in Maine. I'd love to maybe get like a different experience maybe somewhere else in the world. And I know they, they, they do them all the time. But uh, t- tell me a little bit about um, your, your the BJJ camps that you go to. I think you mentioned that you've been to a few different camps, right? Well, I've been to that main one a couple times. Okay. They're, uh, yeah, Lake Manitou or whatever. Yeah, dude, it's awesome out there, man. 170 mm-hmm. people, cabins, like all you can eat, like your food's hot after training. Yeah. Oh, man, it's awesome. Like, you train like eight hours a day, right? Like, yeah. So eight times like five, man, you get like, you get like six weeks of training and you come back take a couple rest days and you're on fire, right? Yeah. That's one thing that I had a hard time. I, I, I took video of everything that I could, uh, cause the instructors were super open with people filming. Uh, and it, I knew there was a lot of information. I wasn't going to retain 95% of it. So I was really happy that I did f- film it. So that way, when I came home, you know, I can go back into the footage and start like picking at all the information that was given. But I mean, it is so much info. And I think people that go there, Um, if you're going for technique and to learn new things, it's good, but because it's so much information, I would suggest people, you know, pull out a camera and ask the professor that's teaching or the instructor that's teaching, ask them if it's okay to film. And if it is like film it, because there's just so much info that you won't be able to retain everything. Well, the good thing is, uh, now what they do is they film every single class and they post it on YouTube. It's called, uh, Globetrotters in action. Yeah, man. Check out Globetrotters in action. They have all the classes at, from every camp, dude. Wow, that's cool. Yes, man. It's awesome. It's all free. Wow. That's so re- Actually, you know what? In three and a half weeks, dude, I go to um, the Globetrotters Arizona camp uh, just outside Phoenix. Okay, cool. What uh, what, yeah. what, what, what what made you go out there? Uh, well, just uh, basically going to these Globetrotters camps, I've made a – pretty good connection with a, a bunch of the instructors right and we've come become pretty good friends we keep in touch a lot and hmm. we've had guys come up here to toronto uh from the states to visit and i've went down to the states to visit them and so we've been trying to meet up uh every time we travel and um so everybody's going to arizona so i'm going to arizona <laughs> <laughs> nice so so as, as as a brown belt are, are you are you getting i'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious like i know there's a big social aspect to it and you know the the, the gold triders kind of move in packs right you know you tend to get to know people and everyone's networking and you get to share ideas do you find that that you get a lot of knowledge out of these camps that you go to because again they are expensive so you know if it was uh you know a white belt or a blue belt who's saying hey should i really do one of these camps and what do i get out of it you know do you do you think it's worth it man if, if you're a white belt or a blue belt the knowledge is overwhelming it's unbelievable you can leave with so much knowledge and leave so much better in a week it's unbelievable mm-hmm. these camps never existed back in the day when i was like starting jujitsu i would have loved it it would have it would have fast tracked me for sure right yeah but um like for me i just roll I don't drill. I drill. <laughs> again. I don't learn techniques. I just, I my jujitsu is based off concepts, mm-hmm. right? So like, if I'm in a position, I just okay. Your foot goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, right? There's no actual move. So like, I don't really go to classes, and I, I go to the classes and drill and stuff like that. But I don't like. I'm not trying to learn anything new, really. Mm-hmm. Other than other than details within techniques that are like conceptual details, right? Right. Like things that can help my game. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, no, for sure. I, 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 it's I, weird. Yeah, I, I really like the camp idea. I wish there were more options when it came to camps, you know, that were maybe there was more – things locally i mean how cool would that be to have like a like a canadian version right like a canadian camp where you get people from all over canada spending a week together sharing jiu-jitsu knowledge who knows we should we, we, we should start something i don't know it sounds like a great idea but uh, they have something great going on and you know it's when you think about it you know people will pay you know people will pay to spend a week with people who are passionate about the same thing and share a bunch of knowledge. And uh, it's definitely a great idea. I just wish there was more of it, right? Especially if it may be something local. Yeah. So it was, you know, a little bit more affordable too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that would be really cool. The thing is about these camps too, eh, is all the techniques aside, 
all those 170 people, you look around, you see them all. Every single one of those people has something that I don't know yet. Right. Right. And, mm-hmm. and that's the my that's what's mind blowing to begin with. Hmm. So, and, and that's techniques. So that's before you even learn a technique, right? Just by talking to somebody, you, you can learn something, even off the mats, right? On yeah. or off. Oh, so. definitely, definitely. So, how, how long have you been a brown belt for now? Um, I got my brown belt in the end of 2017, okay, I think. Nice. Okay, nice. Yeah. Does uh does black belt make you nervous a little bit? Um, it'll it'll come when it's when it's time. Yeah. It doesn't make me nervous. I try not to think about it. I just try and <laughs> focus on my next goal. Of course, I've thought about it, and it's I want it. But the more I the more I want it, the more I feel like I shouldn't want things. I should work for it. So I'll get it when I deserve it. Nice. Yeah, that, I think that's a that, that's a big topic too, right? Especially for people that, you know, I, I can give you a good example of myself who came from a traditional background. I, I have a black belt in Kyokushin Karate and, you know, there was a billion belts and like every couple of months we would get a new belt. And when I switched over to jujitsu, it was like, you mean I'm only going to get a belt like every three years? <laughs> like, I'm yeah, losing exactly, my right? mind. I actually started in a different school. I actually was with a Gracie Baja here in Montreal. So we, we actually got stripes on our belts whereas at uh, brazilian top team we don't have stripes so you just get a belt when you get a belt so it was a little bit more comforting when i was at least getting stripes but when i had to move away from that it was like it happens when it happens it was really hard for me to transition from that mentality of karate working hard getting belts but getting them you know often enough where it's keeping you motivated and keeping you going and i was taking less of a beating in karate than i am in jiu-jitsu so it was even harder in jiu-jitsu to be like you mean like i gotta get choked out every single night for the next three years for me to see a belt but i guess after a while it took me till like maybe even the end of blue belt to like once i got my purple i was like okay like I, I was stressing about belts when I was a white belt and a blue belt and it seemed like maybe it was my instructor and you know stuff that we spoke about that kind of you know reassured me and maybe I just had a, I, I got a different outlook on you know the the value of belts and it, it had nothing to do with the belt it was really what I was learning and the experiences that I was having but I I think there are a lot of white and blue belts that stress a lot about you know getting stripes on their belt and and getting belts and why isn't it happening soon enough do you, do you have any advice for these people who are stressing you know as a white belt or a blue belt stressing about man I still don't have my first stripe or you know I still haven't gone on my blue belt is it any any advice you'd be able to share these guys uh just advice like uh just just keep working hard like it's you know eventually eventually it's going to catch up like there's the they're worried about a couple stripes now but the learning curve (laughs) is forever right like you're you're always going to be learning like you're always time goes on the club isn't going anywhere jujitsu's not going anywhere there's no jujitsu is not a race whether it's a roll white belts need to slow down (laughs) or it's after the stripes they need to slow down right it's not it's not a race it's a it's a lifestyle and that's the problem it's it's there's no quick fix in jujitsu it's Mm -hmm. it's a lifestyle and if you don't lead the lifestyle you're gonna fall off you're you're gonna stop going yeah how many how many times do you find yourself training per week um when I, I like I've been in competition mode since June first about. Um I've been training six days a week, sometimes twice a day. Okay. Have you have you always trained that much? Um I wanna say I started training a lot more come purple belt. I would say white belt probably three days a week. Okay. And then as a blue belt I would probably four to five days a week. Purple belt was five to six and then now it's just basically six days a week. Wow. And then and then every every now and again, like I'll take three days off and then come back and go, you know, five straight, you know, take two off, whatever, right? But I try and train fairly consistent. I I, th- I think that's the that's the main point too, right? And what what you hear professors say all the time that it's 
it's about the consistency, right? It's showing if you're going to say you're going to go to class three days a week, then try to make it a point to go three days a week, right? And not do three days one week, don't show up the next week, do once the, the, the week after is to be consistent in your jiu-jitsu. Even if you can't go, you know, five or six times a week, which a lot of people would love to do that, you know, but it's just, you know, people have families, they've got kids, they've got jobs, you know, they like you were saying that people work shift work like yourself, you know, you can't always make it out every single time that you want. But I think consistency is key, even if it's just a few classes a week. Yeah, you know what, even two classes a week, like a, a Monday and a Thursday, that's enough to keep your skills sharp, where they are, keep them from deteriorating. Mm -hmm. right? You take time and your skills start deteriorating and then you sharpen them back up when you come but twice a week you can keep your skills from deterioration right yeah I, 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 yeah I, i'm kind of in sorry? the same boat i'm in the same boat because I, I i was training a lot i was doing six seven eight classes a week and my body was like I, I just couldn't recuperate. I was training injured. I wasn't training to my full potential. And I thought that training that much was really getting me somewhere. And I had to take a step back and be like, you know what? Like, I don't feel good going to jiu-jitsu. I find like it's, it, it's more work. I'm putting too much physical work into jiu-jitsu when it shouldn't be like that. So I toned it down. So I toned it to two to three times a week. So I, I try to focus really on three times a week. And I find that when I do go – like I'm in beast mode. Like I feel 110%. I'm, I'm training without any injuries. So my jiu-jitsu is like super on point compared to when I was training more that I would always have a lingering injury. So, you know, there were some things, some techniques that I, I, I would normally do that I couldn't do because I was, you know, sore somewhere. But now training three times a week, I find that the, the quality of the training that I'm getting is so much higher than if I was training many times a week. And I, again, I have a wife, I've got, you know, two kids and it's just, you know, I have a full-time job also. So, you know, I'm trying to manage everything. And I think three is that sweet spot, even though I probably could fit in more during the week, but I think physically, I mean, I'm 40 and I, I just can't, I, I just can't do it anymore. I know my, my recovery is too hard. So I personally, I found that sweet spot at three. I don't think there's a global rule for everyone. I think everyone has a, has their own potential. Some people can train 10 times a week. Some people can train two. I think everyone needs to kind of just focus in on their personal life and what they have going on and then trying to find that balance and find that sweet spot where you're going to class, you're enjoying going to jujitsu and you're progressing at the same time. Yeah, like um, I, I would say in that scenario, definitely the the when when you're training, you have to listen to the symptoms of overtraining. Or there's actually no such thing as overtraining. It's called under recovering. Mm -hmm. So under recovering, um, you know, if you're not getting your 100% nutrients in for the day, if you're not getting your eight hours sleep, you're not gonna recover 100% that night during sleep. Mm -hmm. Right. If you only recover to 80 percent and then you do it the next day, the next day, and the next day, and eventually you're going to be going to jujitsu at 40 percent, you're going to be going, oh, I have a nagging injury and I'm exhausted. Th those are just symptoms of under recovering. You don't actually have a nagging injury. It's just a symptom. It's you've heard of people say, listen to your body. Mm -hmm. That's your body telling you to back off. Right. So a lot. So for me to train six days a week, I am. I am focusing very much on recovery right after my session. So as soon as my session's done, I'm doing ice baths. I'm promoting recovery. I'm doing things to promote recovery. I'm taking all the proper nutrients that I lost during the training session. I'm also taking all the proper nutrients that I need to recover my body. Macronutrients, micronutrients, all that stuff, right? Your electrolytes. And again, an ice bath, um, Ice something, spend half an hour, ice something. Even if you don't need to, ice your knees then, right? Always do something to promote recovery because promoting recovery is injury prevention and and preventing the under-recovering slash overtraining syndrome. Hmm. I, I've, I've never done the ice bath. And if you're saying it, so, I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> so so what you're you're just filling the bath with a bunch of cold water are you putting you're actually putting ice in it or you're just lying in a cold cold bath 
So the best thing you can, you, ultimately you can go to the store and get like big bags of party ice and throw it in, in your bathtub, but that gets expensive. So what you do is you get big balloons and you fill the balloons with water, throw it in your freezer. Hmm. Once they freeze, you basically fill your bathtub up with cold water. You take a hammer and you smash the balloons and then you get in and you stay in there for five to 10 minutes. Hey, that's smart. Look at that. Yeah. And now here's the thing about you when you were talking about your training and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, not every training session needs to be hardcore. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually be like Monday and Wednesday can be hard sessions. And then Friday can be like 50% easy, like just drilling and taking it easy and just having fun with jujitsu without having to like really exert yourself because then you can use that as a recovery day and you're still getting an extra session in and not have to stay home. Right. right right yeah that oh that, that that's a good point yeah i think everyone wants to go hard all the time but i think that will catch up to them right we're doing this for life man we don't have to go hard 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 it's not a sprint it's a marathon yeah right? my what uh, one of my professors mark saint marie uh he he said that he's man i, I don't want to get his age wrong because there else he's gonna he's gonna choke me out a few times next class but i think he's in his I want to say mid fifties now, and he's gone through the ringer. I think in every single sport, uh, he got his black belt, uh, not too long ago. And, uh, he said if he had to redo it, he would have calmed down as a blue belt and a purple belt. If he would have known, he would have calmed down his training to know that he was going to go this long doing jujitsu and he would have, you know, been better off for it. And his training would be, a lot easier now whereas when he was a blue and purple he was just going balls to the walls all the time and he's suffering for it in his 50s now so he tells all the students including me that if i could give you one piece of advice take your time recover do it properly because you're still going to want to do jiu-jitsu when you're 60. yeah well you can't calm down as a blue belt man <laughs> you can't you gotta go hard <laughs> Maybe as a purple. Not as fast as, Maybe as, as a the purple. white belts, but you're still going hard. <laughs> nice. Well, Kyle, man, th th thanks very much for, for, for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. For everybody that wants to check him out, go on his Facebook page. He's always posting cool stuff. He posts his matches, too, from competition. Uh, he's always posting cool articles. So you can check him out on Facebook. It's Kyle, K-Y-L-E, at last name Sleeman, S-L-E-E-M-A-N. Uh, you could check him out in at Bruckman uh, in Ontario, which is in Oshawa. Right, Kyle? Yes, sir. Awesome. So you guys have open mat. I guess people, you guys are pretty open to people dropping by to open mat from other clubs. And Oh, yeah. We have people come by all the time. Bruckman, uh, he's he's very open. He has an open invite all the time. So uh, anybody's welcome to come by. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, brother. Hey, no problem. Anytime. I'm sure we'll run into each other soon. We're only one province away, so we're not too far. And, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for being on, buddy. Thanks a lot, bro. I appreciate your time. You've been listening to Let's Talk Jiu-Jitsu with Raymond Terrence. Go follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page. Turn on notifications and press that like button. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the mat.